I wanted to talk a bit about the modern left and what gets called wokeism, because I think everyone recognizes there's something radically different about the modern version of the left and what's motivating and what's animating them than has been traditionally the case for the left. And wokeism itself is a strange kind of phenomenon that needs explanation. And I think a lot of the explanations that are offered to explain this miss the mark to varying degrees. You could call this Marxism, but this is very different from any traditional sort of Marxism. You could call it just more liberalism. I think it is accurate to call it liberalism, but at the same time, clearly there's a radical difference between modern liberals and liberals even of the 20th century. It's not really an explanation to look at the theories of John Locke or Thomas Hobbes and just say it was a direct line of descent from then, that as soon as a theory of property rights and individualism was formulated, that it was going to end up with uh, the kind of borderline religious sacraments we saw last year with the BLM movement. And some in the more radical right would look to Christianity and say that this is a Christian movement, that wokeism is actually the true essence of Christianity. But this also, I think, misses the mark, even though there may be some truth in it. Certainly we see this more in post-Christian societies than anywhere else. But to say that wokeism is the true essence of Christianity, uh, that it's more true to Christianity than actual Christians, uh, I think is very much mistaken. And when you look at the way that these people view the world, sure, there are similarities to Christianity, there is overlap, but there's also radical differences. Uh, there's positions that would be radically heretical to the Christian worldview. One way to analyze the phenomenon of wokeism is to look at the way that language has evolved in the last couple of decades under its influence. Recently, there was the trailer announced for the new Matrix movie. And it's interesting to look back at how much language has shifted since the original Matrix movie. Now, the Wachowski sisters who directed the Matrix are both trans women. And they've since come out and said that the Matrix was something of an allegory for their struggle as trans people. Uh, originally, there was a character called Switch who was meant to be male in the Matrix and female outside of the Matrix or vice versa and this was shelved by one of the producers. But you can see in The Matrix there is this kind of Gnostic picture of the world that suggests that perhaps someone's real identity is in a certain sense outside of the confines, the prison of the material world. But at the time of the first Matrix, when people talked about transgenderism, that was seen as basically equivalent to being transvestite. It was a man or a woman um, acting out as the opposite gender. And in the years since the first Matrix, language has changed such that we recognized that a trans person was a man born in a woman's body or vice versa. And this is a radical shift that is part of wokeism that is actually transforming our whole understanding of reality. It's easy to laugh this stuff off as SJWism or whatever, but these things have come to define people's understanding of the world. Their true language and true normalization of certain concepts, they're shaping people's whole metaphysical understanding of things. And wokeism is a kind of metaphysics. It is a kind of pseudo-religion, I believe. But that transition wasn't the end point. Because we've even moved on from that conception of things where now sex itself is socially constructed. And gender is not binary in that one is uh, born a man or a woman in a man or a woman's body. But there is no binary of sex and there is no binary of gender. There's infinitely many genders or gender is a kind of fluid spectrum. At that point, when gender is no longer binary, it has no connection to sex at all. It has no connection to any reference point in the material world. So gender now is a subjective identity which no longer has any connection to anything in the physical world and is something that has no objective referent. It's just something that we understand someone to be based on how they describe themselves 
and the categories that they use to describe themselves don't have any definition because again they're not connected to anything in the physical world um, and people have come to accept this but this is a radical revision of our whole understanding of reality now someone's identity is an entirely subjective entirely interior thing and people might think that this is quite similar to, say, a Christian understanding of the soul. You know, someone's soul inhabits their body, and of course their soul isn't physical, uh, so it is a kind of ghost in the machine. But this isn't the traditional religious or Christian understanding of what the soul was. Traditionally, this kind of more radical dualism, where the soul or the psyche was totally separate from the material world and inhabited physical bodies as a ghost in the machine, uh, was associated with heretical sects of Christianity like Gnosticism and uh, non-Christian movements like Manichaeism. But in Christianity, they took the Aristotelian view of things, this hylomorphic perspective, where we are composite beings. So far from being an external instrument, the body is part of our personal reality. And while it can't exist apart from the soul, it's not inferior. Uh, the idea of the soul in Orthodox Christianity would be the substantial form rather than the ghost in the machine. You can separate the body from the soul in analysis, but not in fact. There's this idea of the body-soul composite. And this is really the traditional understanding of things that was ruptured uh, in the modern age, especially with Cartesianism. And you get this view of the world where there are two uh, irreducible substances. There is the outside material world, uh, there is matter, and then there is the interior uh, subjective world of the, the psyche, and neither one is reducible to the other. Now, this is really the whole basis for the modern understanding of the world and the modern project is a wholly inductive model of research combined with a totally mechanistic view of nature. And in this picture, what looked like elements of nature misattributed to the human intellect are removed, like the idea of final causes, formal causes, purpose at all in nature. Now, when people like Francis Bacon were promoting the scientific method and promoting this use of inductive reasoning, this was never intended to serve as a metaphysic. But for the purposes of the scientific method, the interior, the subjective, was placed in a separate domain. But it was kind of inevitable that this uh, pragmatic step would turn into a kind of metaphysics. And this kind of radical dualism, this radical separation of the interior and the exterior, the objective and the subjective, has become a popular metaphysic. And this lends itself quite well to the idea that the interior self needs to be liberated from the constraints of the physical world. And that liberation, the purpose of that liberation, is to give that interior self a free, open space of possibility. So choice really becomes sacrosanct. When there's a picture of a soul, uh, that's intimately tied up with a conception of God, with a conception of objective values, with a conception of the good. Uh, the soul only makes sense uh, in reference to a laid stone of an absolute good. Uh, there is a perfectibility of the soul. When you have a totally mechanistic view of nature and you shift from the soul to the self, uh, the distinction is that there's no objective good for a self. A self is more a kernel of subjectivity that's kind of encased in these multiple layers of physical constraint. And we're no longer really embedded or embodied in the world. Now we are thrown into the world. We're thrown into bodies. There's now a thrownness to our nature that's wholly arbitrary. And when you're thrown into the world like this, aspects of your identity that come from being an embodied creature, uh, your sex, your race, your nation state, uh, 
uh, your particular traditions, your language. These are no longer valuable aspects of your identity. These are now false and arbitrary impositions that are actually hindrances to the true realization and exploration of your true self, which is something that is wholly psychical, wholly subjective, and denied the chance for self-exploration and discovery by these arbitrary collective impositions. And so you can see how the liberal ideal of individual maximalism, or the leftist tendency toward liberation projects, takes on a special metaphysical, almost spiritual significance now. And while the woke left is quite a modern phenomenon, you can see its antecedents in the movement of modernism and leftists and liberals that attached themselves to that in the early 20th century in the United States. And modernism and people like Oscar Wilde and James Joyce and Friedrich Nietzsche were very focused on this idea of self-discovery. And this really comes to fruition with the existentialist movement of the mid-20th century and its maxim that existence precedes essence. The means of salvation in a meaningless, absurd universe that we're thrown into against our consent is this project of the absolute affirmation of the self. Now, the reason that things like the LGBT movement are so important and the reason that wokeism has really brought this front and center is because this really pushes this dualistic picture of the world into center focus. And when you think of the worst possible sins that you can commit today in terms of how it's viewed by the radical left, the worst thing that someone can be today is a racist, um, with you know a close second being if someone is sexist or homophobic. And another terrible thing that you can do is to generalize. It's just an accepted maxim now that you can't generalize. To generalize someone is evil, even if there's good empirical reasons to think that a generalization may be accurate. It's just absolutely evil to impose that on someone. Uh, and what these have in common is that the worst possible sin in this pseudo-religion is to constrain the absolute freedom of someone's self with reference to something in the material world. If you claim that uh, someone is uh, limited by something biological about themselves, whether that's uh, race or gender or something else, then you are affirming physical constraints over the subjective psyche, which is meant to be absolutely free. And the right and the left both justify themselves now with an appeal to the liberation of the self. In the case of the left, they believe that the self will be liberated by a destruction of prejudices, destruction of things like racism, homophobia, but also a destruction of those embedded identities themselves by an end to identification with national groups, with religious traditions, with gender. And the left believes that the best way to achieve this is through collective action, uh, through the state. The right the establishment right disagrees, but it's really only a pragmatic disagreement. The right believes that this transhuman future will be achieved through the function of the market. And they certainly have history on their side when they point to the market as the force that has liberated people from traditional gender roles, that has um, destroyed traditions and ended prejudice, brought women into the workforce and so on. Uh, and this is the disagreement of establishment politics today. And both justify their side of the project with reference to an absolute evil. And the absolute evil since the Second World War has been the Nazis. And Nazism occupies this kind of metaphysical evil because it is the affirmation of the physical over the psychic uh, 
to the point of a people being wiped out just for a physical characteristic. It's the absolute denial of that interior space of that group which was persecuted. And so the left and the right both justify their positions as basically the best position to prevent another genocide. The left says that that genocide was caused by racism, by tribalism, by racial collectivism. And so the focus should be on destroying that kind of racial collectivism through collective action. The right disagrees and says that that genocide was caused by statism, by the worship of the state, and the way to prevent something like that arising again, the way to prevent uh, collective racialism is through weakening the state and promoting individualism, individual maximalism and individual rights. And this is the dynamic, this is the dialectic of liberal pluralist societies uh, that is accelerating and becoming more explicit now with wokeism. And what's interesting is that many of the early proponents of what we now recognize as sort of woke left ideas were also proponents of transhumanism. The best example is Martine Rothblatt. Martine Rothblatt is a trans woman who has donated hundreds of millions to advocacy for the transgender movement. And she wrote a book called From Transgender to Transhuman, a manifesto on the freedom of form, which, in my opinion, is maybe the ultimate manifesto for what's called wokeism. Because in From Transgender to Transhuman, Martine Rothblatt says explicitly that transgenderism is really to be understood as a first step. It's the uh, bringing in of this revolution of the freedom of form, as she says. And she spells out clearly that this new picture of the world is about liberating the self from the physical world and technology will be the means by which that is achieved where eventually just as uh, you know prejudices towards sex disappeared as women entered the workplace that technology will make it so that none of these physical differences matter anymore we'll all be augmented it will be possible to separate our consciousness from the body and so talking about someone's identity as related to the body, the physical world at all, is just going to become outdated by technology. And transgenderism is really just a, a first step on the road to that recognition. In the conclusion to that book, she writes, quote, Together, law and science, heat and light, are the tools we must use to liberate society's potential for unlimited expression of sexual identity. As we do so, we evolve from wise man, homo sapiens, to creative person, persona creatus. We emerge from our prison of sex into a frontier of gender. We step from a history of biological limits up to a future of cultural choice. We unleash at long last the full, unbridled power of human diversity on our planet's prolific problems. The outcome of this gender awakening will be a new species, a new transhumanity, one that has as its fundamental purpose the assurance of a healthy and fulfilling life for all who value that right. Now I think if anything captures what wokeism is, it's this passage. She's affirming here the project, uh, the utopian project of the liberation of humanity from form, from nature. And you can see the kind of religious nature of this, where we started out with this constraint of the natural world and we are progressing gradually to this eschatological horizon of the final liberation of the self of humanity from the constraints of nature and in this kind of pseudo religion as you can see technology takes on a religious significance technology techno capital is the means by which we are liberated from the physical world now, there's a wonderful coincidence of wants here between what Martine Rothblatt is promoting and other aspects of the post-war order and the desires of the oligarchs. Not only does this line up perfectly with the post-World War II mythos that justifies the 
exclusion of nationalism from the public square on the basis of the inevitability of genocide if people collectivize racially in the West. It marries itself perfectly to that because if the absolute good in this pseudo-religion is the liberation of humanity from the constraints of nature, then again, the absolute evil is judging people on the basis of physical characteristics, is racism and racists. And so the Satan-like figure uh, in this view of the world is Hitler. Uh, and so that lines up perfectly as the negative aspect of the positive vision of the world being promoted by this transhuman view of things. But there's also a perfect coincidence of wants between what the woke transhumanist movement wants and what the oligarchs and international capital wants. Both want the destruction of inborn identity. Both want this fluid picture of humanity where someone's identity is decided entirely by choice. For the capitalist, that's consumer choice. And the capitalist desires a destruction of anything that is a barrier to profit. And traditional social orders, traditional moral systems, traditional gender roles, nationalism, these are all barriers to international capitalism. They're all barriers to commodification. They're all barriers to the capitalist ideal of a borderless, globalist world in which prejudice is absent. And again, people are purely defined by consumer choice and there's no barrier to those people consuming. In fact, there's a necessity to them consuming because consumption comes to define their identity. And so the woke left's project of emancipation also becomes the international capitalist's project of commodification. And this is why wokeism has been and will continue to be so successful, because it gives a religious-like legitimacy to the projects of the oligarchs to create an international global market and the project of the Atlanticist powers since the Second World War to prevent an outbreak of nationalism. And finally, as mentioned, it gives a religious significance to techno-capital itself as the means that has liberated humanity and will eventually liberate humanity from the physical world itself. Now, it's interesting that this kind of belief system would pop up at what seems to be the end of an empire, the end of a period in history. And Gnosticism, uh, that dualist Christian heresy, popped up at the end of antiquity. And some people have compared the woke left to Gnosticism. You can certainly see the similarities in the picture I've laid out. But what's different is, you know, Gnosticism was a kind of Western Buddhism. And it still had a spiritual picture of the world, it still had a picture of ultimate reality, and it was ultimately pessimistic about the potential for liberation within nature. Ultimately, the point of Gnosticism was to turn away from the world, to achieve gnosis or enlightenment, union with the true God uh, beyond the evil demiurge, and reject the physical world. It was a pessimistic creed, but it was also a spiritual creed, whereas this transhumanist picture of things, this selfism, maybe is a good way to describe it, this uh, absolute commitment to the liberation of the self, this is fundamentally an optimistic view of the world. Again, it sees things as progressing inevitably from constraint and prejudice and imposition of uh, inborn identities to liberation of the self and the free choice of the self, liberated through technology. And it also lacks a spiritual aspect. It doesn't have a picture of ultimate reality, except the mechanistic scientific view of the world, which is bound up with technological progress, which ultimately will serve as the liberation of humanity. But this always remains a wholly imminent project. There isn't an absolute good. There isn't a gnosis or an enlightenment. There isn't a God to commune with, and there isn't eternal life, except potentially an infinitely extended life 
a true augmentation and technology. Even in Gnosticism, there was a certain inborn difference in the quality of people. There were hylics uh, or somatics who were the lowest of people who it was said would never be able to achieve Gnosis. And there were psychics and pneumatics who were higher types who were more open to enlightenment or to the Gnosis, to an understanding of things. Uh, even that is, is absent from this transhumanist, selfist view of things. So there's none of the spiritual value of traditional religious structures in this. It's a wholly imminent utopian project that finds its fulfillment in the material world and in this project of liberation. And that's why adherence to this pseudo-religion are so animated, so motivated, so aggressive in a way that, say, traditionalists are not. Because the traditionalist doesn't believe that their ultimate purpose, their ultimate realization or liberation will come in this life. The adherent to wokeism is entirely fixed on this utopian endpoint, this eschatological horizon of liberation of humanity from the material world. And that's why I think wokeism is here to stay. It's not just a fad, it's not just millennials with too much time on their hands, it's not just something that was conjured by a few think tanks to distract people from economic issues. It is a pseudo-religion with all of the animating force and conviction of any other religion, maybe more so. And it's the realisation of a number of tendencies and assumptions that have been present in Western thought for centuries now. And that's really why conservatives, or part of why conservatives have been so ineffective in pushing back against this stuff, is because they don't have a similar animating force that can drive them to the kind of fanaticism that this picture of the world, this selfism, can. And even if they achieve sort of piecemeal legislation like removing critical race theory from schools, something along those lines, in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference because this pseudo-religion, this metaphysical picture of the world has come to be the basis for most people's moral beliefs. True culture, true language, true imposition. It is the basis for how we frame our moral positions. And it may be that only an equally radical, comprehensive religious view of things can actually dislodge this and push back against it. But what form that will take, how or if it will manifest, remains to be seen.